Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Hello. How y'all doing? What's up, creator? Mulata? Robin? Mincha? Peggy? Alfred? Florence? Reformed? Duffy? Taminator? Jerry? What's up, everybody? Thanks for jumping in. What's up, Daz? Yo, yo, yo. How y'all doing? Nicole? Lori? Furniture Company? Good morning, Alma? Thanks for joining me, guys. Type in the comments where you're checking in from while we get loaded up here. Um, just in case you are new to my ministry, my name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. Good morning, good morning. What's up, Jeremiah? I've written OKC. We got somebody in OKC. Um, sorry, got sidetracked there. <laughs> Reading all the names coming in. Um, okay, so I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon, Cleveland, California, Seattle. I'm in Missouri. Check out my books. Now, if you've read any of my books, please do me a favor. Go back to Amazon. Leave me a quick review. I greatly appreciate those. I get some good feedback from my books via email. But a lot of times when I receive those emails, that person forgets to go and leave me a review on Amazon. So if you've if you've purchased a book from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, wherever you've gotten it, please go back and leave me a quick review. Australia, Chicago. Um, what else? Uh, I have a podcast. The name of my podcast is Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. Maybe you are brand new to my ministry and you like podcasts, check out my podcast. It's available on every major podcast platform. Again, Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. As you can see, I'm just walking and talking. Well, if you're listening on the podcast, you can't see anything. Um, now, if you are listening to the podcast, maybe you enjoy the podcast, pause it, leave me a review, and then come back and finish this Walk Talk. Um, I'm also on YouTube. Be sure to check out my YouTube channel. I didn't do YouTube for years and years and years, and then the past couple years, I started doing YouTube. I have everything indexed on my walk talks. You can search anything I've done in the past. Now, if you're on my YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button. If you wanna subscribe, give me a thumbs up and hit the bell button if you wanna be notified when I, relate, when I release anything new. Good morning, good morning. Connecticut, Monterey, Italy. Awesome, you guys are everywhere today. All right, what else? Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm a regular person just like you. Nothing against this title of pastor or this man-made position of pastor because that's what it is. It's nothing like we see today in the box church, according to the Bible. Um, but I say that in the beginning because so many people think they can't say anything about Jesus unless they're a pastor. Pastors, according to the Bible, are not what we see today on planet Earth. It's nothing like that. We see what we see today because of what started in the first century through an early church father named Ignatius of Antioch. Now, when you hear the word church father, you can think, oh, that's the truth because it was an early church father. Well, just because something is super old doesn't mean it's super true <laughs> or true at all. The early church fathers were messing a lot of things up. There's a lot of things that oppose the gospel. So uh, here's another thing. Jesus said, Jesus said, call no man father. So there's no such thing as a church father. When I label somebody church father, I'm just trying to tell you about the time they lived and how the early church operated. The early, after the first century, things went downhill pretty quickly. <laughs> Ignatius of Antioch started to write letters back to individual groups of the ecclesia, and he set up a bunch of stuff, which is complete error. One of those errors were was called the one bishop rule. This person was in charge. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that path today. I've done a full, multiple full walk talks on that, but it, that digressed even further when the Reformation started, John Calvin, Martin Luther, they took this word bishop and they, it was called pastor before that, but by the time of the Reformation, 
they really latched on to this word pastor. John Calvin loved the word pastor because Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. So we practice going to a building, listening to a person named pastor, or we think that that person has some type of special hotline to God because of the man-made man -made title, and they don't. <laughs> That's tradition of men, okay? So I say all of this because I want you to be confident in who you are. You can say whatever you need to say about Jesus. There's no titles in scripture. There's no top-down authority system. There's nothing of what we see today in the institutional churches everywhere. That's nowhere to be found in the Bible. And we're going to talk about that today. All right. Now, if you want to contact me, please do not message me on social media. Go to my website. Go to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. With you there while you're there, sign up for my free daily devotional. Wow, the sun is amazing today. <laughs> it's springtime and it's warming up. <laughs> Got the trees blooming behind me. Whew, it's a beautiful day. I love this. <laughs> um, but while you're on my website, sign up for the free daily devotional. Go to my free newsletter tab. I'll send you a daily devotional once a day. All right, so let's get to today's Walk Talk. Why church buildings are not biblical. Now, I, I you know, I don't really care for the word biblical. <laughs> but when I was trying to come up with this title, sometimes I got to use stuff that I don't completely agree with. There's a lot of things that people say, that's not biblical. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are biblical, which don't apply to us um, because of what Christ has accomplished. And when you hear that, you're like, oh, no, here we go. He's cutting up the Bible. No, I'm not. Don't cut up the Bible. Leave the Bible exactly as it is, but read it based on what Christ has done at the cross from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, so when we talk about um, biblical, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are in the Bible that don't apply to you such as if you do any work on the Sabbath, you are to be put to death. That's Exodus 35 two. Oh, and real quick walk talk. Last week I said, if you do any work on the Sabbath, I said Deuteronomy 35 two and it's Exodus 35 two. I know where it's at. Don't know why I said Deuteronomy, <laughs> but you know, that just goes to show you, I don't have to be perfect every time I speak or I, I am perfect, my identity is, but my speech doesn't have to be perfect. If you follow a ministry and they are never wrong, they never mess up, they never make mistakes, <laughs> let that be a red flag for, um, this is a little cultish. That's how cults are set up. The, the great and all-powerful leader, the great and all-powerful know-it-all knows everything. They are infallible. Me. <laughs> You're going to get some stuff when I'm doing these walk talks. We're like, hold on. You scan through scripture. Oh, he got that. That's in that spot, not that spot. If I notice that, I will correct that in my next walk talk. And I noticed it when I was proof listening to my last walk talk. But Exodus 35, 2 says, if you do any work on the Sabbath, you are to be put to death. It's in the Bible. It's biblical. The Bible also says, don't shave the sides of your beard. <laughs> I would be in trouble. <laughs> the Bible also says, don't touch a bird in a bird's nest. <laughs> there are lots of things that scripture says where we have to read it in context of what Jesus has done. We are supposed to read the entire Bible based on what Jesus has done, even though Jesus doesn't enter into the story officially as a human until the Gospels. All right. So, um, so why church buildings are not biblical? So, first of all, before I begin, <laughs> you might be thinking, oh, wearing pants is not biblical. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, Macmillan. <laughs> you know, we could go down a path of uh, lots of stuff. That's not biblical. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. That's not biblical. Doesn't mean we should, shouldn't do it. That's the... And normally when this type of feedback comes across my comment section or in my inbox, it's because that individual is finding their identity in something that is not in the Bible. And they want to prove <laughs> that just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. 
So let's let let's let me step to the side here for just a minute and say, I'm not against a church building. I'm not here to tell you to stop going to a building. I'm not saying there's something bad with a church building. I'm not saying these church buildings, they all need to stop and we need to deconstruct them and blah, blah, blah. And you, anybody who goes is wrong. I'm not saying any of that. I go back to the Bible, unearth your freedom, and then you get to decide what you want to do with that. Okay, I, when, you, when you hear free stuff, you can think that somebody is saying something that they're not. <laughs> so, uh, and I know that. So I try to remember to tell you what I'm not saying. So I'm not saying a church building is a bad thing. I'm not saying stop going to church. But I'm also not, also not saying a church building is a good thing. And I'm also not saying start going to church. That is where the box church will really jab you. <laughs> because you say something and then you say something... And you don't say it exactly like they want you to say it. That's where it can really go downhill. So, but that's freedom. And the modern church, the box church, the institutional religious system that we have set up today, there's no freedom. <laughs> there is no freedom whatsoever. So when I talk about church buildings and people have the mentality of, nope, you got to get up and you got to go to a church building. It's in the Bible. This is the holy place of God. It is a wonderful time to be in the house of the Lord. All of that stuff there, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Because all of that stuff there is not in the Bible. That is superimposed man-made tradition onto the Bible. And that is not the authentic gospel. <laughs> okay. So I'm not saying stop. I'm not saying start. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying we see church buildings as something that has no biblical foundation. So where did this begin? That's what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> because if it's so practiced by so many people, it's got to be true, right? I mean, everybody does it this way, right? Well, Judaism was practiced 1,500 years before Jesus. They had a building. They had a holy location. They had a religious system. And what did Jesus say? That temple is going to be destroyed. I'm going to build a new temple. Think about that. <laughs> and I'm not even saying these church buildings need to be destroyed. But Jesus said that temple will be destroyed. This location, which is repeatedly sanctified through the blood of animals, will be destroyed. And then he's going to build a new temple. And he said that in, let me get across this road here. He said that in John 2. So in John chapter 2, he said, I'm going to destroy that and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. Now, in essence, he's talking about himself, but he's also talking about us, <laughs> me, you, the body of Christ. But they could not fathom that. They seen this temple which took so long to build. They see this temple where all of this religious activity was happening and everybody went there. Everybody saw that location as the place to be, the place to be close to God, the place of worship, the building. And, you know, unfortunately, our modern church even goes to a lot of the Judaic scriptures and they pull out the word temple and they attempt to use that word temple as church. The temple is not church. <laughs> okay, so that's it. That's what we're going to dive deep into today. Um, so yeah, so Jesus said he's going to destroy the temple, build a new one. That's me. That's you. So when you think of the word temple today, think of the church building. Okay? Because... Our modern church treats the church building like the Hebrew people 
treated the temple. But it was destroyed, rebuilt, and now we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, you're the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, you're the temple of God. Twice. The Hebrew people never saw themselves as the temple of God. They went to the temple of God because that is the holy place with the holy person who is assigned to do holy work. And you better be somber when you hand off that bull, goat, dove, calf. We have taken all of that stuff and we've shoved it into the body of Christ. And, and, and <laughs> some people will say, oh no, McMillan, I got you right here. If you look in the book of Acts, they went to the temple, did they? Oh, did they? Oh, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> What's interesting is everybody listed in the book of Acts were mostly Hebrew people. And when they were going to the temple, it was to evangelize for Jesus to get the people at the temple to stop going to the temple. <laughs> They didn't get up at 9, 30, and 11 on a Sunday, go to the temple and listen to uh, Pastor Levite <laughs> give a sermon. And then you, he passes the plate and you give your tithe and your offering and then you sing and then you shake hands. And then you go and you have your fried chicken dinner or you go to the Chinese buffet. None of that. <laughs> when you see the temple in the book of Acts, they are going there to try to get them to come away. Because their very scriptures, the Messiah came through. <laughs> so when Paul was rejected by them, they're like, this is not the Messiah. The Messiah is not this Jesus of Nazareth. Paul said, okay, peace out. I'm going to go over here to the Gentiles who did not even have these scriptures. And I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And he did amazing things. <laughs> But we can't say that the temple is a church building. We can't say that the Jews went to the temple. Therefore, we go to church as a church building, as a temple. The Jews had jettisoned a place of worship. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 4 that we will worship in spirit and truth. That is the type of worshiper that the Father desires. People don't understand that because <laughs> when he was speaking about spirit and truth, he was clearly speaking about the opposite of the temple because they worshiped at the temple. They did temple work. <laughs> this is what the entire book of Hebrews is about. And Hebrews 10 verse one says, those worshipers could never be made perfect through what they were doing. You know, what, they were, what were they doing? Offering animal blood sacrifices daily in order to draw near to God, in order to be repeatedly sanctified. And it is this location that was being sanctified, but it could never cause them to become, to draw near to God. It could never cause them to be sanctified. That's why Hebrews says it had to be repeated. Christ comes along, offers his sanctifying blood once and for all time, therefore making us the true worshipers that God desires, who worships in spirit and truth, 100% sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 10, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, you have been sanctified, past tense, past tense. Every future tense sanctification passage in scripture is describing somebody who will believe in the future, not you. Because the only thing that could sanctify the Jews before the cross was animal blood. That type of worship, God does not desire. Sacrifices and offering, he has not desired, but a body prepared. And that body is Jesus. And it was prepared once. You have to deal with the fact that you are now sanctified. Because only blood can sanctify you. And Hebrews chapter 13 says he will not offer his blood again to sanctify you more. You're the temple. You're the building. You're the house of God. Yeah, another quick side note here. So often you'll hear, oh, we're going to go to the house of the Lord. We're going to go to the house of the Lord today. 
This is an awesome Phil Wickham song. Great beat. I love Phil Wickham. And it's called, Let's Go to the House of the Lord. I listen to it, but I, I don't agree with the words. Because this location is not the house of the Lord. They called the temple the house of the Lord. Before the temple, it was the tent. You are now the house of the Lord. This building that is built in your local community is built with the same two by fours and drywall that your KFC was built with and the strip club. It is not the house of the Lord. That's you. First Corinthians, excuse me, Hebrews 3, 6 says you're the house of God. Hebrews 10, 21 says you're the house of God. It says we have a priest over God's house who does not have to offer sacrifices for his own sins before he could offer sacrifices for the sins of the people <laughs> you know the Le the levitical priest he couldn't offer his he could not offer the sacrifice for the people until he did it for himself jesus doesn't need to do that he never sinned <laughs> tempted in every way but never sinned so he is able to empathize with us the levitical priest could not empathize with you because he had to do the same thing that the Hebrew people had to do. So, another holdout on this would be, oh no, Acts 20, verse 7. They met on the first day of the week at church. Did they not? Okay, first of all, the first day of the week would not be a particular holy day. We're going to get to where that came from, okay? The first day of the week just mentioned. It's the first day of the week. If we are going to say Acts verse 20 is proof text to say, thou shalt go to church, first of all, this was primarily Hebrew people. The first day of the week was not the Sabbath. It was Saturday. They all knew that the law could not be changed or modified according to Deuteronomy 4.2, their own Torah. So we cannot go to Acts verse 20, verse 7 and say, no, this is going to church on the first day. It's a commandment. They changed it. This is how it is. Also, when you read the context of it, you can't just go to Acts 20, verse 7 and pull it out and say, go to church on a Sunday they gathered. That verse was not entered into the actual Bible until the 16th century, as in the number. So verses, now it was all written. <laughs> Acts is written by the hand of Luke being spoken from Paul to Luke. Now, when Luke was writing this out, he did not write Acts, verse 20, verse 7. He just wrote. <laughs> and when you're reading and reading and reading, you finally get to that verse. There was no number. So they did not prove text. Proof text began in the 16th century with the Protestant scholastics. They would take a verse, build a doctrine, take another verse, smash it all together and say, boom, believe this or else. And proof texting is demonic. <laughs> the devil proof texted <laughs> in the wilderness when he talked to Jesus. Acts 20 verse 7 is Paul encouraging a group of believers as he travels this is not at a church building. He's not a pastor. He's not preaching a sermon. He's just talking to them for a very long time. <laughs> so that's not proof text <laughs> to say thou shalt go. I mean, it is proof text if you want to proof text it, but it is, there is no proof in that particular text when you read the context around it to say thou shalt go to church. We would have to superimpose man-made tradition on the scripture. A lot of people will use Hebrews 10, 25, thou shalt go to church. Hebrews 10, 25 does not say thou shalt go to church. <laughs> it says do not forsake the assembly. What are, they, what are they doing in this section of scripture? What is Hebrews chapter 10 talking about? Hebrews chapter 10 is talking about this repeated animal sacrifice by way of the Levitical priest at the temple and the, comparing it to the once for all sacrifice of what Jesus did at the real temple in heaven with his own blood once. If you start back in verse 9, you read all the way through chapter 9, read all the way through chapter 10, you will get the context. The author is encouraging them to continue to gather, to encourage one another and spur one another on towards love and good deeds about Jesus, not about temple work. He's trying to get them to 
repent from temple work toward the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. And the very next section of scripture, Hebrews 10, 36, excuse me, 26 through 31, he is saying, stop going to the temple because there's no animal sacrifice left there for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was the final sacrifice. Again, the temple. And he's saying, stop going there. There's no sacrifice remaining for sins at the temple. But we use this on a Christian and say, if you deliberately keep on sinning, there's no sacrifice. All of your sins are deliberate. You're not a robot. Now, according to the Hebrew people, you could deliberately sin according to the law or non-deliberately sin according to the law. They had 613 different ways to sin. They had to remember all 613. Sometimes they would deliberately sin knowing full well, all I got to do is go to the temple and hand off my lamb. This is also why Jesus said in the book of Matthew, leave your sacrifice. Leave it at the altar. You don't get to get forgiveness. Go get right with your brother. And he actually says your brother needs to get right with you. <laughs> what else? What's another passage? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's not go to church. That's, that's on Saturday. <laughs> And the Seventh-day Adventists will say, oh yeah, we do it right because we remember the Sabbath. Well, here's the thing. That has nothing to do with, with going to church, even still. <laughs> they didn't go to church. Also, that's just one of the 613 commandments. You have to do them all. All or nothing. James 2.10, Galatians 3.10. So you, you're going to have to either do them all or none. And you got to be Jewish. <laughs> if you're a Gentile, you were not included in that covenant. Ephesians 2.12 says you were without hope in regard to that covenant. You weren't there at the base of Mount Sinai saying, we will do everything in the book of the law. It is not a covenant with you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, why church buildings are not biblical is because... We don't see this anywhere in the epistles. You would think that if our body of Christ, the body of Christ, was to be set up on a church building, a location, an edifice, we would see one instruction somewhere <laughs> in the epistles, in Acts, a commandment to go to a building at a certain time to listen to a sermon from a pastor, from a pulpit, we don't see the word pulpit anywhere in the New Testament. We see it in the Old Testament. And is it a pastor preaching? Nope. It's the priest Ezra reading the book of the law. <laughs> and most pulpits will do that. Only they'll mix in a little bit of grace. So you come back next week for, for another dose. <laughs> so how do we get to this? If, you know, and... Just, I know I'm going to get some feedback on this. And somebody's, oh no, we got the church in Rome, the church in Ecclesia, the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae, the church in Thessalonica, the seven churches in Revelation. Well, here's the thing. First of all, the seven churches in Revelation, those are symbolic locations of the groups of the Ecclesia. This wasn't written to number 12 Oak, Oak Street, uh, number 12 Main Street, Laodicea, <laughs> and the zip code, postage stamp. This was groups of the ecclesia in that group or in that region, in that region, in that region. There was no First Baptist, Second Baptist, Catholic, Protestant, anything. <laughs> the word church means living organism, ecclesia. You cannot go to what you are. The early church father, Clement of Alexandria, said, a perfect quote. You cannot go to what you are. So the churches in Revelation, those are not locations as in a church building at a city. It would be me, you, all of our friends and family in that region. <laughs> Same in Rome. It would have been that group in Rome. It wasn't a church building at Rome. Same in Thessalonica. It was a group of the Christians, a group of the ecclesia in that region. It wasn't a building. <laughs> so where'd this come from? If we don't see it, 
and we practice it, man-made tradition. I say this all the time, man-made tradition. We are practicing man-made tradition. Now, Jesus warned against man-made tradition. Paul warned against man-made tradition. Now, here's the thing. There are good man-made traditions. But the way you can determine whether or not it is a good man-made tradition is if it's based on the gospel. If it's not based on the gospel, it is a bad <laughs> man-made tradition. So what we see today is blatant man-made tradition because we don't see any indication in any of the epistles for a church building. Now, am I against a church building? Again, if you're just joining me live, I'm not against a church building. I'm saying they're not biblical. They're not holy. It's not the house of God. It's not the temple of God. <laughs> it's not sanctified. It's not a sanctuary. There's not blood being poured out in there. That's the only way you can make it the sanctuary is if there's blood being poured out in there. We call this place the sanctuary. Got to go to the sanctuary, this big open area. <laughs> According to the Bible, that's not a sanctuary. So, the first church building wasn't even erected until about 150 years after Jesus. Now, building. This still was not a church as in a place of worship. It wasn't a place where they gathered at, you know, 8 and 1030 on Sunday and then 6 o'clock on Wednesday. And then they'd have a potluck dinner on a Friday night. This is nothing like that. It was simply a place for them to gather because they had outgrown the houses. <laughs> and many people say, oh, right there, McMillan, you nailed it on the head. We are supposed to have house churches with daddy as pastor and then mama's in second in command. And then we got these families that everybody come enjoy at our house church. It is biblical. House churches are not churches either. <laughs> Acts, uh, Acts 7.48 says, The Most High does not dwell in houses. <laughs> in certain translations. Does he dwell in your house? Yes. But as in that house is a house church, therefore God is there, therefore we're supposed to do church like this at houses because it's biblical. The early church did not say this house is a church. It was just a place where they ate and gathered and spoke about Jesus and celebrated together and mourned together and prayed for one another. Most house churches are just miniature big churches. <laughs> Most house churches spin off from somebody being hurt at a mega church or a regular church. I'm going to go start my own church at my house and we're going to do it right. And then I'm there's not going to be any leader, but I'm going to be in charge. And then eventually it just turns into another church, only it's at this guy's house. When we go to the only part of the Bible that describes our gatherings, 1 Corinthians 11 through 14, is this a house church? No. <laughs> They just gathered in houses because they were still small enough groups to be able to do that. And then by the time of AD 200, they outgrew those walls and they had to have a bigger place to gather. That's it. It was not a church building. It was not a house church. That is you. You are the ecclesia. You are the living organism. You are the church, not the building. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, man-made tradition started this. So if it if it started with man-made tradition, we got to find where that happened. It's got to be somewhere in history because a tradition starts by somebody starting a certain practice and then you repeat it. And traditions die hard. I mean, you, <laughs> for example, if somebody is used to having Thanksgiving dinner at their house, they've always had Thanksgiving dinner at their house, and then for years and years and years and years and years, and then one year they do not, they, they don't want to have the Thanksgiving dinner at their house. And they let everybody know, we're not having Thanksgiving here this year. We don't want to have to host or clean up or whatever's happening. People would say, but it's a tradition. 
<laughs> it's a tradition. We always have dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, child. What are we going to do? It's a tradition. We'll take that and apply it to what's happening with these church buildings because it's a tradition. This tradition began in the fourth century. And it began with an individual by the name of Constantine. Constantine was a Roman emperor, the Roman emperor, <laughs> the most famous of all time. Now, picture the United States of America and the leader of the United States of America. And the leader is a pop culture icon. This is not a political walk talk. <laughs> I don't get into politics. Uh, and I do have my political opinions, but picture the most powerful, famous person on the planet. Think of that person now. Think of Constantine. That's who Constantine was. The, the most rich, famous, powerful person on the planet above the most powerful government on the planet. When he did something, people believed it as true. And people fell in line. Now, back then, they respected political leaders <laughs> a little bit different than they do today. However, Constantine wanted to legitimize Christianity. Here it is. This is where church buildings came from. Constantine wanted to legitimize Christianity because he claimed that he was a Christian. Whether he was or not, I don't know. That's not for anybody to judge. But because he wanted to legitimize Christianity... He copied pagan temples and Jewish temples. The pagans and the Jews, he said, they got their buildings. We're going to have our buildings. So he ordered church buildings to be constructed. This is where church buildings began. Official church buildings began in the 4th century through the ordering of of Constantine, the Roman emperor, not because of anything that's in the Bible. This tradition started then, and we think because it's so old, we should practice it today. But again, <laughs> Judaism was around 1500 years before Jesus. They had a building. Old doesn't always equal the truth. So when Constantine started this, he basically was starting a tradition that everybody practices today. Now, the, 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 I'm not getting into all this, but he was influenced by a lot of the early church fathers. And a lot of the early church fathers struggled with egregious error, egregious covenant mixture theology, egregious um, <laughs> antichrist theology. Under the guise of, I'm a great orator, I'm a smart person, I was bestowed, I was ordained. And, you know, all of that stuff that came from the early church fathers, which was interwoven with the church service, the church liturgy through Constantine, still is practiced today because it was so popular. So here, here, here are some of the things that Constantine did with these church buildings. Okay. So the church building started in the 4th century with Constantine because he was trying to make Christianity a legitimate religion. <laughs> Constantine, no, well, let me tell before I tell you what he did with the church buildings, let me tell you a little bit about Constantine. <laughs> um, and I'm not judging him. These are just historic facts. Constantine also worshipped the sun god. The air quotes, because there is no sun god. But he worshipped another fake god, the sun god. Because of that, he made Sunday the official holy day. This is why you think you have to go to church at a building on a Sunday. Because Constantine started the church building and then he made it official that Sunday is the holy day where you go to a building. Now, this building, he modeled it after the Roman Basilica. Now, a Roman Basilica is a place of government functions and civil activities. So it was longer front to back, then side to side. There was an area up front where people spoke or interchanges were made. And then you got this bigger area in the back where all of the 
the, the most populated area was that watched the front. This is where we get our entire church structure from. <laughs> Constantine. Roman imperialism. Modeling the church buildings after the Roman basilicas and saying it's official. You got to go here on a Sunday. It is an official holy day of Rome. Because he also worshiped the sun god, hence Sunday. Uh, now, at these Roman basilicas, named Roman, Roman basilica-style church buildings, there was a person named Bishop up front, which started with Ignatius of, Ignatius of Antioch. The bishop sat in a big chair, and he gave a sermon. Sermons are Greek rhetoric, is Greek rhetoric. Again, more Roman imperialism shoved into the liturgy, the church service. This is where we get it because it's not in the Bible. <laughs> it's a tradition of men which started with Constantine. Okay. Um, so what, what else about Constantine? Constantine had his eldest son put to death. He also had his nephew put to death. Also had his brother-in-law put to death. I'm not saying he couldn't have been a Christian and done that, but <laughs> just to tell you a little bit about his actions, <laughs> which are revealing a lot of his character. Let's see, what else about Constantine? Constantine copied the pagan practice of holy items. Now, his mom was so obsessed with holy, air quote, holy items, <laughs> because there are no holy items. There is no, nothing physical that you can hold that is holy. That's you. <laughs> the only thing to make it holy would be the blood of Jesus. But which, which makes me think of this. His mom was so obsessed with objects of worship that she traveled to the Middle East and supposedly found the cross of Jesus and the nails of Jesus and took it back home. Now, and I think that would be pretty cool, <laughs> but that's, that's a, that's a tree. <laughs> that's wood. That's metal. It's not holy. And even though the holy blood was on it, even though the holiest of holy was poured upon it, and it would be amazing to have, you are the holy place, not the cross. You are the holy place, not the nails. Those nails made you holy. But Constantine was obsessed with relics. His mother was obsessed with relics. That's why it's practiced so much today. It's not because it's in the Bible. <laughs> There's nothing holy about any particular item anywhere on planet Earth. There's nothing holy about any particular geographic location about anywhere on Earth. Even calling that area over there the Holy Land began with Constantine. We just say that's the holy land today. What's so holy about it? Jesus said, we will worship in spirit and truth. No physical location. Holy things happen there. But guess what? Holy things happen here as well. You. You're holy. But we practice this. We say it's old. Everybody does it. Everybody has uh, holy old items, relics. <laughs> Start it with Constantine. Constantine, after naming the capital, Constantinople, after himself. Imagine if I named this place McMillan Stantinople. <laughs> that'd be pretty cool, actually. Uh, McMillan Stantinople, that'd be a long word <laughs> to write out. So after he named the, 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 the city Constantinople, he adorned the city with treasures from pagan temples. <laughs> now, this is the father of the church building. <laughs> okay, he's the one who came up with, we got to build church buildings so we can, we can be legitimate. What else? Oh, in Constantinople, he constructed 12 monuments. Okay, 12 monuments in a circle. 
each one of those monuments represented one of the 12 apostles. In the center was a tomb. Guess whose tomb that was? <laughs> Constantine. Constantine. He wanted to be the 13th apostle. <laughs> he thought that this would be a holy place and people could go there and it would be a place of worship because his grave is there. He thought graves were holy. <laughs> he built churches on top of cemeteries because he believed that cemeteries were holy places. This is where we get shrines from. <laughs> Jesus said the flesh counts for nothing. These are shells. <laughs> Once our spirit is gone, that's it. If you've, if you've heard anybody give a, a near-death experience, once they hover up over the body and they look down at the body, all of them say, that's like a dirty pile of laundry. It means nothing to me. Because this body is going to go into the ground. <laughs> Everything holy about you is going to be with Jesus instantly. Now, there's nothing wrong with your body. Let's just do a little sidebar here. <laughs> Paul said all three parts of you are blameless when he wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, spirit, soul, and body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the house of God. You cherish your body like Christ cherishes the church. There's nothing wrong with your body. There's nothing wrong with your flesh. Now, the flesh is an issue, but you are not the flesh, but you have flesh. That's a long walk talk in itself. Search my YouTube channel. <laughs> But your body is good. But here's the thing. When Constantine saw physical bodies as something special after the spirit had left, he began to build churches on top of them in order to say this Christian church, this Christian temple, this Christian place is legit. He built a church on top of Peter's grave. He built a church on top of Paul's grave. <laughs> He built a church on top of the tomb of Jesus. He built a church on top of the place where Jesus was born. <laughs> we follow it. Man-made tradition. We think, oh, well, this is old. Everybody does it. We all get up on Sunday and go to church. and This is the house of God, and that's, that's in the Bible. It's not. Start it with Constantine. So you're free. You're free to go to a location which has been finely crafted by hands <laughs> and you're free to not. So what matters at those locations is the message. Now, I was listening to Christian radio the other day and the DJ was like, well, if you start going to church, you're going to feel better and don't just... You know, this time of the year, you might be thinking about going to church because it's Easter or somebody might be labeling you a creaster because you only go to church a couple times a year. I'm here to tell you, just go to church and you'll feel better. Just go to church. Get up and go to church. That can be some of the most damaging advice you ever get. Because what matters at church is not the church. What matters at church is the message. If the message is not about Jesus, if the message is not about who you are as a new creation, that will be the worst place you could possibly go. So if you do go to a building <laughs> called church, okay, with all due respect, who cares? What are you hearing there? What, what's going in your ears every, every Sunday? Are you hearing you're completely forgiven because of Jesus? Are you hearing you're completely righteous because of Jesus? Are you hearing you don't want to sin, but when you do, you're still forgiven? Are you hearing all of the good news about Jesus? Or are you getting little droplets of it now and again? And then, oh, but you got to, you cannot, you, you, you don't want to leave God. You want to stay committed to God and don't leave him. Don't leave God. Stay committed to God. That's error. You cannot leave God. You cannot leave who you are one spirit with, especially through your actions or attitudes. Paul told Timothy, even when we are faithless, 
God remains faithful. Paul told the Colossians, Christ in you, your hope of glory. Paul told the Corinthians, you are one spirit with the Lord. So if you're one spirit with the Lord, if Christ will never leave you, if you can't leave God because even when you're faithless, he remains faithful. If you're hearing this message that your behavior can somehow cause you to leave God, that is a bad place to be. That is against everything that Christ accomplished. That is against all of the good information which comes from hearing the new covenant. We're obsessed with the buildings, but we are not dissecting the message based on what Christ accomplished at the cross and through the resurrection. What is the message? So many people think, I just got to go to church and I'll straighten my life out. That is error. Many people go to church and their life is in shambles. Many unbelievers go to church and nothing's regenerated in them because they thought that going to church was going to help. But the message that they heard at church has nothing to do with the good news of what Christ accomplished nor who they are. But we see the building. We see the group. Everybody's going there. All my family and friends. We've been doing this for so long. I don't want to be left out. Think about the early church. They stopped going to the temple. And I'm not even telling you to stop going to church. I'm telling you, what's the message at the church? Is it about Jesus? Or is it about this amazing building? We're trying to collect $100,000 today because we got this new wing we're trying to add over here. And then have certain people stand up who give more than others, pitting people against each other, making other people jealous, <laughs> creating pastures, pets. So much error, so much man-made tradition, which just is just practiced and practiced and practiced. Oh, so Constantine started this. It's not in the Bible. We practice it today because of what Constantine established. So why church buildings are not biblical is because it's just not in there. Any, there's not the connotation of a building. <laughs> there's a connotation of groups. There's a connotation of everybody getting together. There's a connotation of loving one another. There's a connotation of impacting the culture with gentleness and respect, impacting all of these pagan situations with the truth about Jesus, the Judaic situations with the truth about Jesus, but no building. So if, if you think that a church building is in the Bible or that it's biblical that you go to a church building, you are just believing something that you've been taught from the tradition of men. God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. God does not dwell in house churches <laughs> built by human hands. He dwells in you. Before the cross, the holy place was the temple. And the only thing that made it holy was the ongoing bloody sacrifices. And God did not even want that. He loves animals. But he had to have a way to deal with the sin of the world. He had to have a way to get humanity back in his good graces. He had to have a way. Blood through animals did that ongoingly at the building. Jesus comes along, sets that system aside, offers his blood once and for all time to bring you near to God. And you cannot undo this once you've trusted in this because your old self dies. You are buried in the tomb with Jesus, resurrected with Jesus as the new creation, fully united once and for all time. Romans chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're new. 
You cannot be unborn from God. You cannot give up your salvation. You cannot cre- you cannot commit apostasy. You can no you can no more not be the house of God. Then grace would no more be my child. She can deny it and be mad at me all she wants. She could say I'm not Matt's daughter. You're born. <laughs> Same with you. You're born. <laughs> Why? The blood of Jesus shed once and for all time and you trusting in that event. This causes you to be the temple of God. That's you now. That's you. All right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some truth and maybe some error. But you should always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. There's nothing wrong with you. And you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.